Anyway, uh, my, uh, my niece, she shared a joke with my sister the other day. She said, the real miracle about Jesus is that he had 12 close friends in his 30s. And I had to respond to that, of course, in a boring way by pointing out that, well, they weren't so close, and when he asked the three closest friends to pray with him, they fell asleep, and, um, and then he was all alone when he died. And that was kind of a boring response, but um, I could see that uh, they had a lot of fun with that. What I wanted to talk about now is, where are we? in terms of our situation. Socrates talks about, he said that the unexamined life is not worth living. So I thought maybe we should start, or continue rather, to examine our life at this stage of where we are right now. I especially felt this when leaving Las Vegas, is that the name of a movie, Leaving Las Vegas? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> hopefully, everything that got out in Las Vegas stayed in Las Vegas. <laughs> but anyway, when, I, when we left Las Vegas, I felt, um, okay, so this is what we've done. We've done a liberation ceremony. And um, what are we doing now? What am I doing now? And uh, so I started to think about a lot of things and... Uh, I felt this Sunday service I'd like to share with you some ideas about the central essence of why we're all here. Because yes, we can ask ourselves all these questions, but really what's at the heart of it all is love. We as humans, we brought our dog here so I'm reminded, we <laughs> We know that life is not just about eating and sleeping and waking up and going to bed. That somehow in this experience that we call life, there is this essence that we're seeking and it's called love. We're, we're seeking to experience it, we're seeking to share it, to give it, to receive it, to experience it. But it's so elusive and it's so difficult to understand because it's so intertwined with the highest joys in your life and the lowest lows. <clears throat> Love, it seems, is so inextricably intertwined with pain that sometimes we, we reject it or we hide away from it and we don't want to participate in it for fear of being hurt. So I wanted to just delve into this aspect of love and I know it's a uh, it's a huge topic and it's worthy of so much more than I'm going to be able to spend on this subject matter today. But I thought that it was worthwhile, after having gone through that experience, that I really wanted to get back to why am I here, what is my purpose, etc., etc. So let's get to the, de the definition of love, first of all. That love is not a feeling. Love is not based on how you feel, but it's based on what you do. It's an action word. To love someone doesn't, make, doesn't necessarily mean to make them feel good. Any parent knows that when they're disciplining their child, they're not exactly making their child feel good, but they are helping them. And this is the aspect of the parent's love, that you're giving love to that child, you're helping them frame their world, you're helping to protect them, you're helping them to grow, and the process of loving them is not exactly a pleasant experience for either of you. But it's love nonetheless. So, <clears throat> is loving easy? No, loving is not easy. Reverend Moon in his poem, Crown of Glory, talks about the pain of loving. The pain of loving. Think about that for a minute. When you think back on your experiences of love, can you think of broken hearts? Can you think of disappointment? Can you think of grief when you lose a loved one? Can you think of the absolute joy that you experience when you're with your loved one or loved ones? Yes, I'm sure we all can. When you get to a certain age, there's a whole bunch of experiences that you've had with love. And yet somehow we keep drifting away from it. 
<coughs> Yesterday, uh, I woke up earlier than my uh, counterpart <laughs> and uh, went to the kitchen and I decided, okay, today's the day. <laughs> and uh, this is kind of a big deal for me, but I decided to make my wife breakfast in bed. Okay, so get the potatoes, I cut them up, put them in the oven, I fry them, then I get the eggs out and I'm chopping up the you know, meat and putting it in there with the cheese and the salt and the pepper and the coffee and all that. Trying to get it all together, all warm at the same time. <laughs> and then presented it to her. And then she was so happy. I'm glad to say, I mean, that was genuine happiness, not fake. Okay, that was, yeah, because she's a very, she's German, she's very straight. She's not going to tell me, she's not going to tell me lies, like, oh yeah, that was great. Um, no, so she was very happy, but I was completely exhausted. <laughs> Loving is not easy. It is a difficult thing. And then I'm thinking, this is what my wife does every single day of the week. She wakes up early. She makes sure the kids are up. She gets everyone's breakfast on the table. She gets in the car, probably the first one in the car, even though she has the most to do out of everyone. I mean, think about it. You're a kid. You get up. <laughs> and you're so groggy and grumpy. And all you got to do is brush your teeth eat your food, and get in the car. Very simple. Do they do that? No. <laughs> so, anyway, the whole aspect of being a parent is like exercising your love muscle every day. Every day. And you get good at it, but it's not easy. And it's easy to understand why some parents decide to shirk their responsibility because loving is not easy. It's a challenge. It's a grind. Sometimes it's repetitive. Sometimes it's just lonely. It's a very lonely experience when you're preparing people's breakfast at 5 o'clock in the morning and you're all alone in the kitchen and everyone's tucked away in bed. So loving is a, is a difficult thing to do and we find it very challenging. So why do we love? I decided to just go straight to, uh, since we're a God-fearing community, I would describe this in terms of God. We want to resonate with the living God. This is why we love. You, know, you, think, you think to yourself, logically speaking, why would anyone love? It's too risky. It's like, for instance, if I said to you, if you invest $100, there's a... Wait, wait, let's say, let's, let's make, it the, make the stakes a little higher. Let's say I tell you this. If you invest $100,000 there's a 90% chance that you will make $5 million. 90% chance. Will you invest $100,000? <laughs> you know, the thing is, a lot of us are very risk averse. We probably wouldn't. Why? Because there's that 10% chance that it's not going to work out. And we've lost $100,000 of hard-earned money grinding it out for years to make that 100000 just to lose it in a gamble. Same with love. There's no guarantee that if you love and pour out your heart to another individual, whether it be your spouse, whether it be your child, that that love is going to get responded to in kind. So love is a risky business, and it's easy to understand why some people don't want to participate in it. They would rather just stay at home with their dogs. A single person with dogs or cats. They're not risky. You know what they're going to do when you come home. They're going to run up to you and slobber all over you and just like get so excited. You know, my gosh, you're so awesome. You remember that quote that says, why don't you try to be like the person that your dog thinks you are? <laughs> People are not like that. People are not going to guarantee you uh, a pleasant re-entry into the house when you've had a long, days of, long day of work. Loving is a risky business, but the rewards are so great 
that they become worthwhile. But it's certainly not logical. It's not logical to love, to invest your heart and your energy, your blood, your sweat, your tears on a maybe response. It's not logical to do that. But we are not logical beings. We're not. They've done experiments on this, where people think, oh, it's just logical. No, we're not. You've done this experiment where you get two people, right? One gets $10 and one gets nothing. And then the person with $10 decides, I'm going to share whatever number I want with this other person. And then if the other person rejects my offer, then neither, neither person gets anything. But if the person gets, accepts my offer, then we both get whatever we, we settle on. So when this person gets $10, this person gets no dollars, and then this person says, okay, how about I give you five and you keep five? Okay, good. Everyone's happy, so they both keep five dollars. This person says, hey, I'm going to give you one dollar. I'm going to keep nine. This person rejects it. Ten times out of ten, this person rejects it. Why? Have the laws of economics changed? Is one dollar better than no dollars? Of course it is. But why would people reject it? It's because they don't feel it's fair. We are emotional beings. We thrive on emotion. In fact, our emotion precedes our thinking many times. You know, we feel a certain way about someone or something, and then we figure out why we feel that way. And those become our verbal reasons why we don't like this party, why we don't like that person, why we don't like that book, why we don't like that movie. But it starts with a feeling. We are emotional beings. We should never forget that. And we are very incomplete beings too. We don't really have a complete picture of the world. We desperately need each other's wisdom. I think it was Bill Nye who once said, not known for his overwhelming wisdom, by the way, but he did say this one thing which I completely agree with, is that every person you meet knows something that you don't know. So think about that for a minute. That means, collectively, we are very wise. Individually, we're pretty dumb. We don't really have a very complete picture on our own. We desperately, as human beings, we desperately need each other to work together, pool our ideas together, hash things out, and move forward as a society. That involves trust and love. It requires listening, and it requires interaction. But we are emotional beings, so we have to always be careful about that aspect of ourselves. We're not always going to make logical decisions in the best interests of the, of the whole or even of ourselves. Think about how much we abuse ourselves. We abuse ourselves, we deny ourselves so much that, uh, you know, very often we're left with nothing. I was watching this uh, America's Got Talent. <laughs> this is how I spend my Saturdays. <laughs> No, this is how I spent yesterday, at least. So on this show, America's Got Talent, you see some very heartwarming uh, incidences where people come out there on stage and they, you know, bless their souls. They're just exposing themselves to the world, putting themselves in a very vulnerable position and saying, here's what I've got. Take it or leave it. And sometimes they get harshly rejected, which is really painful to watch and sometimes funny. <laughs> to be honest. And sometimes they've really got a great thing to share with the world, whatever it is. This one particular incident stuck out to me because it was this girl who was 29 years old who had gone deaf when she was 18. She had some kind of um, degenerated disease in her tissue and basically her hearing had just gone when she was 18 years old. And while she was studying a music major, so think about that, how disappointing and how frustrated she must have been with her life at age 18, loving music, studying a music major, then going deaf. So she quit school. And so, you know, I think 
I can just imagine that her life kind of spiraled a little bit out of control after that. But somewhere in her 20s, she picked herself up and then she decided to go back to music, of all things. And she had the technology to uh, measure her pitch of her voice by looking at a screen to see if, she, if her pitch was correct and so forth. And then she takes off her shoes so she can feel the beat through her feet. So she can keep the tempo, she can see the pitch of her voice on a screen. She can't hear her own voice, of course. And then that way she can sing and she can write her own music. So she wrote this song, she performed this song called Try. And she explained, you know, the reason why I wrote this song was because um, I had given up and I was sick and tired of giving up and I wanted to keep trying. And that was the song. And I thought it was a great song, it was a very beautiful song. And Simon Cowell loved it so much, he gave her the golden buzzer. <laughs> so that means, you know, forget about it, all the other judges, she's going through. Um, and I think they would have all passed her anyway. It was a great, great experience. So for me, that was somebody who had not given up on herself. She had loved herself to the point where she had relearned sign language. She had relearned how to build herself up in a world without hearing. But so many of us, when we meet obstacles, we don't know what to do. And here's another example. For instance, if I was to say to you, if I was to say, okay, stand over here and make a straight line over to that corner of the room. And then you say, fine, that's not a problem. And you start walking. And then I put a chair in your way. What do you do? You walk around the chair and keep going because you know the destination is that corner and the chair is just this obstacle that's just standing in your way between you and a straight line to the corner and you just walk around it. Well, what if I just say, <clears throat> okay, how about you walk a straight line? Just pick a, pick a point in the room and walk straight towards it. And then I put a chair in your way. What do you do now? You stop. You come to a grinding halt. Why do you come to a grinding halt? Because there's a chair in my way. And I can't walk a straight line anymore. So you might switch directions and I put a chair in your way there. Now what do you do? Well, you try to walk over the chair or you come to a grinding halt again. The point of that experiment is we need a destination. If we have a destination in our mind, then obstacles are just obstacles. It's like, oh, there's no big deal. We'll just do this. We'll do that. We'll do plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E. We have to get there. It doesn't matter if we're on plan Z. We have to get there. If you don't have a goal in mind, you come across some, some kind of obstacle in your life, it's like, oh my God, life's so hard, it's difficult, the obstacle right there, it's a chair, I can't do anything. It's in my way. I'm trying to work a straight line. Straight line to where? I don't know, just a straight line. I'm obsessed with strings. <laughs> we have to figure out where we're going to go. We have to figure out how to get in touch with God. We have to figure out how to be resonating with our Creator, because that's what we were designed to be. We were not just here to eat and sleep and wake up and go to sleep and procreate and eat some more and then go back to bed and then die. That's not the purpose of life. And that's not the design that God had in mind. He designed us to, to grow and to reciprocate in love for eternity. So once you die, dying is just shedding your, your, your skin, your mortal skin. The spirit stays intact with God. God does not designed this world so that he could set it up for his own heartbreak. Like every time a person dies, oh, oh God, I wish that wouldn't happen, but I designed it that way. Oh, another one died. Oh, I wish that wouldn't happen. Oh, but I designed it that way. God is not a masochistic, self-destructive God. God designed us to have a relationship and that relationship is nurtured in your physical life, develops to maturity and continues beyond your physical death. So let's reconsider our life. Let's re-examine re re what are we doing about that relationship because it's the core of why we're here. It's the most important thing. And is it easy to love God? Tell Jesus, ask Jesus that question as he's dying on the cross. I mean, here's the real miracle of Jesus, is that he didn't 
as he's dying on the cross, he didn't just turn around, and there's no children here, so, well, the young one doesn't know what I'm saying, but Jesus, as he's dying on the cross, doesn't say, F you, as he was perfectly within his rights to do so. If there was anyone who was ever permitted to use the F-bomb as they were dying, it was Jesus. He was so unjustly treated, so persecuted throughout his life, and unjustly put to death. He was perfectly within his rights, in my opinion, to use the F-bomb as he's dying and just curse everyone out. The fact that he didn't, the fact that he decided, that the fact that he expressed, exposed the true love that was within him, changed the world. I mean, that was what was inside of him. When you squeeze an orange, what do you get? Yes, orange juice. When you squeeze an apple, what do you get? When you squeeze Jesus, what comes out? True love, right? When you squeeze James Chisholm, what do you get? <laughs> I tell you, it's terrible. I'm reminded of my darker self every time I'm in my car alone driving. It's just awful stuff, awful stuff. So that's what's inside of me. What's inside of you? What do you need to work on? How close are you in reciprocating and vibrating with the same frequency of love as God? Because that's where we're headed. That's what we want to be. We want to live within the bosom of God. We want to resonate with the living God. So our challenge, my challenge, your challenge, our challenge, is to love ourself. Just like the, the girl on the America's Got Talent, she decided to pick herself up, love herself by educating herself, by retraining herself so that she could then express herself to the rest of the world. We have to love ourselves. Whether that means taking a break, whether that means taking that college course, whether it means going out and watching that movie with your friends, whether that means going and taking that coffee break, you have to love yourself. You have to love yourself. Because if you can't experience love, you can't give. You can't give what you don't have. So you have to love yourself. You have to experience the love of God in your life. And then your challenge, and it's a real challenge sometimes, is to love another or to love others. And it's hard. It's difficult. Because we can't expect love to come back. It's a risky business, but we have to have the courage to love. And that requires us to experience the love of God first. If we have the love of God in one hand, then we have the courage to reach out and love others. If we feel totally abandoned, totally alone, totally cut off, we're like a light bulb that's not plugged in. It's like, okay, you have great potential, but you can't give any light. We have to re-examine our lives, take stock of where we are in our relationship to how deep are we within the heart of God, how much are we practicing this difficult thing called love. And the reason why I want to stress how difficult it is is because you might get to Monday morning and go, this sucks. <laughs> and it doesn't mean you're on the wrong path. It just means you could be right in the middle of loving which means you're definitely doing the right thing, but you're in the middle of it. And really, the best things in life are on the other side of difficulty. I saw this uh, short video with Will Smith explaining skydiving. And he was talking about the night before, him and his friends, like, yeah, yeah, high-fiving, yeah, let's go skydiving, you know, in a bar, they're drinking. And then, of course, he gets back to his hotel. He's like, oh, did I just agree to? And then he's fearful that whole night. He can't sleep. And then he's thinking, well, they were drunk too, so <clears throat> hopefully everyone's forgotten it, and then we can meet in the morning, and then everyone's forgotten it, and we can just move on with our lives. He goes down to the reception area. Everyone's there, and they haven't forgotten. <laughs> it's time to go skydiving. 
and he gets into the bus, he gets into the plane, and there's this like red light, orange light, green light. Oh. <clears throat> there's a guy strapped behind you. That's the situation when you first go skydiving. And then they say, we're going to go on three. And you're standing at the edge of a plane. And you realize, this is the first time I've been in a plane with the door open. <laughs> There's so many things that are just like stopping you from doing this illogical thing of launching yourself out of a perfectly good airplane. And so you're standing there on the edge. And the way he describes it is much better than I can do justice right now. But... Then eventually he's, the guy behind you says, okay, we're going to go on three, one, two. And then he pushes you on two. Because when, when it gets to three, people clutch the side of the door. <laughs> and he says, okay, so all that fear, all that fear is right before. You know, the fear beforehand, the fear of, in, in the sleeping and the fear that you ruin your breakfast, you can't eat, you can't talk straight, you can't think straight. You're fearful, 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 fearful. You know, but while you're fearful, you're in a perfectly safe environment. And then as soon as you're out of the plane and you're going down, you're like, ah, this is great. <laughs> you're flying. You're looking, oh, I was at that building the other day. Yeah. And there's the airport over there. And then he says that is the most blissful moment. But it's on the other side of fear. So sometimes you have to tackle the most difficult things in life in order to get to the really good stuff on the other side. And it's the same with love. Loving sometimes feels like a slog, like an uphill battle, a grind, but there's no better reward than having your love reciprocated at the end of it all. But it is a risk, but it is a risk worth taking. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the love that you've poured out to each and every one of us, all of our ancestors, all of humanity. We desperately want to reciprocate with that love, to give joy back to you. Your, your, your heart must be so torn, so in such turmoil, in such pain because of the unrequited love that you have experienced throughout the ages. We desperately want to return joy to you and to live in that reciprocal relationship of love with you as we were destined to be. Yes, there are so many obstacles in the way. Yes, there are so many uh, trials and tribulations. And yes, we are so sinful and, and we're so immature and selfish and we get so easily distracted, but let us set that as a goal so that obstacles do not distract us for long, so that we can develop that relationship with you and go straight towards your heart. So thank you for giving us the role models in history like Jesus and Father Moon and many others who have shown how to love despite all the difficulties, despite all the pain that loving brings. And help us to go towards your heart. So thank you so much, and please bless each and every one of us so that we can be a blessing to others. We thank you and we offer this prayer through Christ our Lord, our Jew and Amen.